Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is so powerful and so deep, and it's just what we need. It's so, so helpful, so practical. It speaks to our hearts. We want you to do that with the word of God today. Please, with your angels, with your Holy Spirit, draw us close to you. Put us in harmony with you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. You know, if I, I said nothing else, we have had such a blessing just to hear um, that young boy read the scripture and uh, the young children sing that song. Amen. I, I, amen. Isn't that the truth? Amen. I, I tell you, um, it, makes me, it makes me just love the Lord that much more when I see these little children standing up for Jesus and I want you and me to be faithful and stand up for Jesus God does not conceal his truth from men by their own actions by your actions and mine, we make truth obscure many times. We make it hazy. We make it foggy. Maybe we make it just gone, not there. We need to live and act what we believe, don't we? That is actually a quote I gave you from Christ Objects Lessons, page 105. In the latter part of the 19th century, some of you are aware, physicians did not practice really good medicine at all. Are you aware our first president, years were cut short on his life. George Washington died years before he should have. And God used him in a unique and powerful way. I'm going to share a sermon with you someday about that. But his life ended because they did a practice that was done around the world then of bleeding. They would bleed them. They would take a sharp knife, a razor, and they would cut their veins and have a cup there collecting the blood, thinking there were bad things in the blood. Well, we all know bacteria can get in the blood, for sure. But we also know, as the Bible says, the life is in the blood. That's what brings the nutrition and the oxygen and everything you need. And that's why when people are really, really um, torn up bad, one of the first things they want to do is give them a blood transfusion. So with all this ignorance, they, um, they did what they did, and they literally killed our first president uh, obscuring what was really needed to be done. And you and I do that in our lives when we don't live what we know is right. By the way, Judy, i got to say it again. Everybody's so glad you're here. I see your face right in front of me. You're a miracle. Praise the Lord. God is good. But the Lord's servant gives us a quote from the book Temperance, page 63. And she tells about a person she met. One woman I knew who was advised by a physician to smoke as a remedy for the asthma that she had. Now, I don't know if you know this. This was very common practice across the board everywhere. In fact... I have an article from Time magazine 
that tells about the Tour de France. That's the greatest bicycle race in the world, Tour de France. They go, I don't know, 300, 400 miles. They go a long way. They go through the flatlands, the beautiful vineyards in southern France. They go up into Switzerland, into the mountains. Tough race, tough race. Pushing themselves hard. And this article shows a picture from about 1920. And it shows two comrades, you know, people compete from many different countries in that. They have teams racing on their bicycles. Two comrades, and one of them has just smoked a bit of a cigarette and he's passing it to his buddy while they're bicycling along, you know, thinking. And of course, you couldn't do anything worse to cut your oxygen supply down. But uh, um, listen to what she comments on in saying this woman that she met and how the physician advised her. To all appearances, she had been a zealous Christian for many years. But she became so addicted to smoking that when urged to give it up as an unhealthful and defiling habit, she utterly refused to do so. She said, when the matter comes before my mind distinctly that I must give up my pipe, or lose heaven, then I say, farewell heaven, goodbye heaven, I want my pipe. I cannot surrender my pipe. This woman only put into words what many express by their actions in life. God's people of hope are a people that are going to be surrendered. What does that mean? At the very heart of salvation history, at the very heart of it, is the great controversy theme. Somebody is really trying to destroy you. And somebody is really trying to save you. And each of you could tell stories in your life how you experienced that oppression, that temptation that was destroying you. And I think most of you, and I hope all of you, could tell a story about someone was trying to touch you and save you. The Lord, His Holy Spirit, another believer coming into their life. We are encouraged to surrender to the wisdom and the will of God. The Bible informs us that God created everything. In the beginning was the Word of God, and the Word was with God. All things were made by Him. It tells us again in Psalms 33, verses 6 and 9, By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them. He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Why did I bother to talk to you about that? Because in your struggles and in your need to surrender, there is somebody bigger than all of your temptations. The one who created the universe, can he deal with your needs? Can you say amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen, amen. We need to surrender and let him work in our life. So my goal as a committed Christian is to take whatever wisdom and resources I have and the Lord wants it to be your gold and to trade those, to share those, to use those. Use your talents, use your gifts to touch another life. Some of you have the gift of hospitality. <clears throat> you reach people. They feel accepted when they're around you. That's important. A church needs that. That's a simple thing, but some of you are very good at that. Some of you are handy men, and you can go to a home, step into a family's life, and you can fix something that needs to be fixed. 
Some of you are fantastic gardeners and cooks. You can touch a life by sharing a little bag of tomatoes, a few ears of corn. Yeah, God can use you. Simple things, practical, good. The message of the prophets is obey and be blessed, obey and live. And it also says disobey God and what? Oh, come on, you know. You will die, you will suffer, you will die. Obey and live, disobey and, and die. Surrender like clay. Put your life in his hands. This is not just about salvation so much as it is a quality of life. I don't just want to live. I want to live a quality life. Don't you? Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in a single verse in Matthew 13, 44, and our young man shared it with us today, it captures the heart and soul of following Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found, when a man found that hidden treasure, he took and sold all he had to buy the field. In Old Testament times, it was common for the rich people to hide their treasures in the earth. Thieves and robbers were a regular part of life. In addition, whenever there was a change in ruling powers, the rich were often targeted to pay large taxes Israel's warlike neighbors frequently came to pillage the land and the crops and wealth. But often the place where the treasure was hidden was forgotten because the landowner died or he was taken prisoner and never returned. And so here was, as it were, lost property, a treasure lost. The average person working a field like the man in our story worked, we would call it here in the South, a sharecropper. And most of you know what that is. You have a piece of land. I'm willing to work. I don't have the land. You're letting the land set. I'll give my sweat and my energy and effort on your land. Now, as I work this land... By your permission, you'll let me keep part of the crop and part of the crop will go to you. So this man was doing that. He was a sharecropper. And as he worked that land, and I used to be behind a plow and plow up the field. And I could tell when I hit a rock or I hit some wood down there on the ground. There was a big difference. This man realizes I've hit something it's not a rock. I want to get it out of here. I want to find out what is obscuring or obstructing, I should say, my plow. So he gets down on his hands and knees, and he soon discovers, whoa, whoa, this is a treasure. Gold, silver, jewels, this is a treasure. And what does the Bible say he does? He wants to buy the field. He's not a well-to-do person, but he has some means. And it says he took everything, everything, and sold it to buy that field. Friends, when you know there's something valuable, you give a lot of energy and effort and thought to try to have that, don't you? I hope in your marriage you realize God gave you something very special and you want to give all for it. What's happening in your marriage, in your home? Are you putting everything into it? The Lord offers us eternal life. Are we 
giving up everything to receive it and let him flow in our life. This man realizes the current landowner likely has no idea the treasure is there. So he buys the field with great sacrifice, putting everything he has into it. Some of his family and friends think he's crazy, that he's lost his mind. And he doesn't tell, he doesn't dare tell anybody else because they might go there at night and steal the treasure. They think he's crazy. But he knows there's something precious there, doesn't he? The treasure, of course, in this parable is Jesus and his plan of salvation. Investing our earthly treasures in the kingdom of God is all a matter of cost and benefit. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Amen. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Christ's purpose for using this illustration is to help our minds catch the value of spiritual things. How many times have you heard me say, whatever this world offers, whatever it is, whatever you want in this life, things, things, property, money, houses, land, whatever you want, position, prestige. When you have that, what do you have? Solomon writes, he says, it's all vanity. It's here briefly, and then it's gone. It's just gone. Is there anything worth trading for the heavenly treasure? Jesus does not require of us any real sacrifice. For whatever we are asked to surrender... It's only because he has something better for us. Surrender and sacrifice are not mysteries. They are a lifestyle. And I ask you, is it your lifestyle? Here's a simple plan of action. Page 70, Steps to Christ. Consecrate yourselves to God in the morning. Make this your first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay my plans at your feet. Use me today in service. Abide with me. Let all my work shine and show for you. I want to surrender all of my plans to you. And I want your plans to be carried out in my life and given up as providence so indicates. Those who have been fitted for heaven through the power of Jesus have hope and it shows in the way they deal with the many blessings that he's constantly giving us. The journey of hope is characterized by a balanced use of what God has given us. Friends, life is short. Where are you putting your time, your energy, and your efforts? Life is short at best. What really counts? What do you show by the way you live is the treasure in your life. God love you and help you. He will heal you. He will make reconciliation with you and those about you when you put your life in his hands. He will save us. Save us from our sins. Save us from ourselves. That's what we all need, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Amen.